Previously, I hiked 14 miles to collect a very useful form of iron ore, bog ore, which we then smelted down into an actual hunk of metal. But because we actually ended up reaching too high of a temperature in the smelt, the result was actually more steel than iron, which initially sounds like a great thing, but that's in a state that makes it pretty much worthless as it is. In this video, we're exploring the relationship of iron and carbon and how to masterfully manipulate their relationship so we can produce the exact properties we want when and where we want it and make steel. Let's get started. Today's video is possible thanks to today's sponsor, Upstart. Your debt can be exhausting and hold you back from many things in life. High interest loans are especially painful as you can just watch your debt go up every month with no escape in sight. Today's sponsor Upstart might be a good option to consider to help escape these challenges. They have helped over 1.8 million customers to get on a path to financial freedom. The process is entirely online with simple and easy to understand payment terms, making it a breeze to set up. You can check your rate in minutes for loans between 1,000 and 50,000 without impacting your credit score. You can even receive funds as fast as one business day after accepting your loan. Whether it's paying off credit cards, Consolidating high interest loans or funding personal expenses, Upstart can help you get one fixed monthly payment with a clear payoff date. Rather than only looking at your credit score alone, their model considers other factors like your income and employment that can help you find a smarter rate for your loan. Check your rate today at upstart.com slash everything. That's upstart.com slash everything to check your rate today. Don't forget to use our URL and let them know we sent you. First, let's start with some definitions. Steel and iron can have different meanings in different contexts as our understanding of these metals has changed through history. We're working from a historical perspective, so let's start from that definition, where basically any metal that's made from iron ore is called iron. The earliest forms were from bloomeries, where a mixture of iron alloys would be produced of various carbon content. The work called section of the bloom, containing slag and iron alloy, also called sponge iron, would be reheated and forged down to a consolidated billet. And the result would be a very low carbon iron called wrought iron. Later, larger blast furnaces were capable of reaching even higher temperatures. They were able to fully melt iron, which would then be cast in a similar way as bronzes. This result absorbed a lot of carbon and produced a hard but brittle iron called cast iron. Then, a little bit later still, a new form of iron was developed through a few different methods in different parts of the world. This new material managed to have remarkable strength. In fact, its English name of steel comes from a proto-Germanic adjective meaning standing firm. Most famous of these was the wood steel, which was made directly using a crucible, but I'll be covering that in its own video later. These different forms of iron and steel were known by their physical properties. It's important to note that while we can talk about their carbon content today, for most of history, its connection to the different alloys of iron were not that well understood, or the fact that steel was even an alloy. The carbon being added was mostly accidental, as it came from the heat sources of charcoal and coal, and at rather small percentages. In contrast, other known alloys like bronze were very clearly made by a combination of two different metals. It wasn't until the 1800s that the role of carbon started to become fully understood and now know the relationship between these alloys, which I think makes it pretty amazing to realize that for the majority of the history of metalworking, the many steps and processes of making and treating steel, for the most part, figured out through blind trial and error. So wrought iron is generally less than 0.1% carbon and cast iron was between two and 4% carbon. Then steel is the narrow band between them of 0.1% to 2%. Steel as an alloy has a lot of complexity with its structure with carbon at these percentages, but I'll get into that a little later. For now, let's explore the method of turning our smelted metal into something actually usable by decreasing its carbon content. I'm Joe Marcello, here again to do some more work with the bloomery iron that we produced last time. Because that last furnace probably got a little too hot in certain places, we have this piece, which has all of these really cool nodules, which actually show that the iron was fully liquefied at a point. What that means is it absorbed too much carbon. And so this is actually high carbon steel to even like on the level of cast iron. While steel is great, this is almost impossible to forge into something workable. So what you can do is use a smaller hearth to remelt everything and either add carbon to that material or remove carbon. And so we actually have to remelt this 
and strip a little bit of that carbon out of it, and it should reconsolidate into something closer to this, which is much more workable. So our last smelt that we did, we ended up pulling almost 15 pounds of usable material, some of it larger chunks and some smaller chunks, but it was a fairly successful run. And hopefully at the end of this process, we'll have probably about 10 pounds of really usable material that then we can forge something cool out of. We just need to get that clay dried out and everything else hot. Hey, we have fire. We're almost ready to start doing the things. Nice. This time we're running our really high carbon material we pulled from the last smelt in through to see if we can pull some of that carbon back out. So we're putting our first 150 gram charge in now. I'm gonna go find some more charcoal. Oh, is it the giant piece? Yeah. I think we're gonna let Moose take a uh, Randy swing at it. Hit it with the flat. There we go. Sort of where I wanted it. Now, why do you keep going there? Not where I want it, right there. Yes, please. Oh yeah, we got some good sparks. I do enjoy how much more relaxed this is than a full smelt, because there is a lot less on the line. All right, so we have one charge left. Last charge. I hope I put enough slag in there. So this could be good or bad. I hope it's good. I was gonna say, the one time where slag is a uh, positive. Oh, she's stuck. <laughs> All right. Well, that's a chunk of iron. Okay. Um, Let me shove twist. Okay, ready? <laughs> <laughs> Why? Just and I'm just gonna have you strike. Okay. I'm gonna have to. Yeah, hit, break off that brick. Right, right there, keep breaking. Okay, and pause. You beat me to it. Rachel's gotcha. Okay, perfect. I would, I would. Hit pause. Perfect. Pause. Hey, why is it in my eyes? Strike. And strike on the top. That's where I wanted to hit the floor. It was quite right. Yeah. All right, and strike there. And okay, uh, now we're going to switch to the end. Oh, that's my shoe. And she's still a little crumbly, but we have done much better. I think we would call that uh, So that is what we were hoping for. That looks a lot better. Yeah, that's pretty cool. So we ran our second run through the refinery hearth. We successfully remelted cast iron from the last smelt. Now we have a nice consolidated bit of bloom that should be slightly less carbon. At this level of refinement, we can actually take it to the forge, consolidated further to get rid of all the rest of the slag and impurities and drawn into a bar of usable material. And from there, we can make something out of it. It's still very hot. <laughs> Let's see, we're gonna put that down now. In a very similar process, more carbon can be added to the alloy. They would have taken this low carbon iron and re-ran it through a refinery hearth to add a little bit of carbon to produce like edge material for tools all the way up to like knives, swords, and spears and things. The amount of carbon that the iron will absorb sort of depends on how much oxygen is present where it's liquefied. With the tweer higher up, we have less oxygen where that bloomery iron will actually be melting. Once the metal melts, then it sinks below where it gets to sit in a nice carbon-rich environment. So it should have enough time to absorb some of that carbon dioxide into it and become steel. It is alive, it lives once more. The slag in there. Right, so we are putting in uh, our first charge of bloom. This one is gonna go right there in that hot spot. It is going to start to liquefy and burn out some of the slag and impurities. And we're gonna cover it with charcoal and it'll slowly burn down. Yeah, it seems like two pounds really is, for this size furnace especially, what it likes to burn through. 
And then it also makes it quick, because two two pound runs like this will make you enough material for a sword. If we are lucky, we'll get an 80% yield. Last one I did actually ended up with like a 95%. So we'll be losing slag and impurities, but we put in enough really nice consolidated pieces. I think we should be good. An hour and 45 minutes worth of work, it's not a bad trade-off. At a certain point, we should also see some bright sparks coming out. This is going incredibly smoothly. Chunky. Are you hiding? Haha! -ha. <laughs> oh, there she is. Not fully consolidated. Again. Let's we'll see. Yeah, so I'm gonna dig around in there a little bit. Hey, the Tweer survived ish. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So I'm gonna be looking for more. Really glowy bits like so. Oh, that's toasty. Perfect, thank you. Hey, we found more iron. Yay, I was set the grass on fire. <laughs> pretty impressive for a tiny little thing. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let's see. Better. Thanks to these extra refining steps, we should now have a chunk of bloom that can be consolidated into a bar of wrought iron and a chunk of consolidated steel we can use for edge pieces. Like what we did when we forged a viking axe with a steel bit. One additional way to adjust carbon content and make steel is called case hardening, which allows you to selectively turn the outer portion of wrought iron into hardened steel, allowing you to have a tool with the best of both properties. So first up, I forged some chisels out of low carbon iron with Adri. So we're just taking this and really pushing it out to start to form what will become the blade of the chisel. We're going to need to draw the whole thing out and make sure we have enough stock in the back to have a handle to hold onto. So now that's actually starting to look like a chisel. All right, so you got that initial bevel set in. We're just gonna compact this material in. That's the chisel blade basically done. Yeah, that looks nice. There we go. Yeah, that turned out okay. And I think that's about where we want it. three sets we can do the case hardening. This method involves coating the low carbon iron in charcoal paste, then enclosing it in an airtight container. Then by heating it to a red heat, but still below the melting point, some of the carbon from the charcoal is absorbed into the iron, turned into a harder steel outer coat. This combines the toughness of iron and the hardness of steel into one tool. The next steps for heat treating the new steel is to quench it quickly in water or oil, and then tempering it by heating it to a low heat. What exactly are these steps doing? Well, that dives into an even deeper understanding of steel as an alloy and its crystal structures. As an alloy, steel is surprisingly complex with many different forms of crystal structures possible in it that impart different material properties. Over centuries, blacksmiths have learned to manipulate the crystal structures of steel, allowing them to adjust the properties of a single piece of steel, working it while it's still softer and then transforming it into something harder at the very end. When a liquid cools into a solid, various points will start to solidify first. With metals, these different points each grow into separate crystal that once fully solid will become the grains of the metal. One simple way to manipulate metal is to control its speed of cooling, which can help change the size of the grains. But heat treatment is even more complex than that, and there are different forms of crystals that can form. 
Different structures of iron crystals can absorb different amounts of carbon. Pure iron actually does not want to absorb that much carbon by itself. In an alloy of iron and carbon, there is some combination of ferrite, which is pure iron crystals, and cementite, which is a compound of iron and carbon. However, they can also exist in crystallized forms combining these two compounds. By heating steel to a higher temperature, existing crystal structures can turn into a new structure called austenite, which is able to absorb more carbon. When cooled, the austenite transforms into different crystal types and phases that can be controlled by the speed the steel cools. Working the steel can put pressure and stress into the grains as they are manipulated. By raising it to this temperature and then letting it slowly cool, a process called normalizing is done, which reforms the crystal structures. Rapidly cooling by quenching forms what's called martensite. These are highly strained crystals, super saturated with carbon that are incredibly strong, but because of the rapid temperature change, contain a lot of stress, so they are hard but brittle. A process called tempering can then be done, which is slowly heating it and allowing the captured carbon and stress to be released, leaving you with the ideal properties of hardness and toughness. In your After all that, I have a nice set of chisels that are now hardened with steel on the outside, but still have wrought iron on the inside, which really produces the best qualities of both. So this video has been a nice experimentation and exploration of the properties of iron and steel. Kind of a deeper dive. It's not something I've really understood myself. So it's been kind of a, a good opportunity to kind of understand what, what exactly is going on. I feel like I have a, a much better understanding and it'll be very useful in the future. And now I think we can definitely say that steel is unlocked and we can use it whenever we need in the future. That being said, the real steel age probably technically didn't begin until the 1800s after the point where we had kind of developed our understanding of what exactly is making steel in the relationship with carbon. Then we inevitably were able to figure out better ways to do it, which resulted in the Bessemer process, which is the super efficient method that's even used today and is what brought down the price of steel from the more extravagant prices that it once was to the more affordable prices of today. What really allowed the modern steel age to begin. So at some point I'm going to be definitely exploring that, but first I'm going to be digging more into crucible steel and the, the most famous Woot steel, also known as Damascus steel. Thanks for watching and thanks again to every one of our patrons. Without you, this won't be possible. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.